In this video, I'll be going through the 2021 Mechanical Systems paper. Question 1. A simple balancing toy can be made by joining two masses with a rigid wire. The balancing angler toy below is an example. It can be approximated to two masses joined by a wire, as shown in the diagram. The distance between the centre of mass of the angler and the fish is 14 centimetres. The pivot point is at the bottom of the pole under the angler and is 5 centimetres below the centre of mass of the angler. Assuming that the wire has no mass, show that the centre of mass of the system is 3.75 centimetres below the pivot point along the line joining the angler and the fish. To calculate the centre of mass, we have this equation on our formula sheet. We'll make the mass of our angler our m1 and the mass of our fish our m2. This is arbitrary and can be any way around. I'm going to make the position of our pivot point our x equals 0. By doing so, our x com is going to be this distance here, which is the distance we're trying to find. Now if we make this our negative space and this here our positive space, our distance x1 is negative 5, and our distance x2 is going to be our 14 centimetres minus our 5 centimetres, which gives us 9 centimetres. Knowing all of these, we have everything for our equation, which gives me 3.75 centimetres, precisely what we're trying to find. Now, you might note that I didn't convert any of my values here. That is that I left my masses in grams, where I could have converted them into kilograms, and I left my distances in centimeters, where I could have converted them into meters. And I certainly could have done so, and therein gotten an answer in meters, which I would then need to convert to centimeters to satisfy our question. The reason I didn't is because I saw that I didn't need to. Specifically, I saw that we have our masses up here and our masses down here. And so essentially, whatever unit we use for mass was going to cancel out. And so it didn't matter that we were using grams. Furthermore, in using centimeters, I knew that I was going to get an answer in centimeters, which is handy because we're asked to find a distance in centimeters. If, however, you're not as confident in this mathematics, then I would certainly recommend you just convert everything to SI units and save yourself the uncertainty. When the toy is rotated about the pivot, a torque due to gravity acts on the toy. Show that when the toy is rotated by 42 degrees, as shown, the torque about the pivot point is 0.0197 newton meters. The gravitational force from our two masses is going to act from the center of mass directly downwards. The component of this force, which is giving rise to our torque, is the component that's perpendicular to the radius, which is this component here. As you might see, that gives us a right angled triangle, where our angle here is our 42 degrees. The equation for torque is force times radius, and by force, I mean this component of the force here, which we need to find. And by radius, I mean this distance here, which is what we just found in the question above. And that is at 3.75 centimeters, which is 0.0375 meters. So let's find our force. Now the component of our force that we're trying to find makes up the opposite side of our triangle, where the side that we know is our hypotenuse. That side is just going to be the combined masses multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity. So since we're dealing with the opposite and the hypotenuse, we need to use the SO component of Sokotoa, which is that sine of our angle, which is 42 degrees, is equal to our opposite, which is the component of force that we're trying to find, multiplied by our gravitational force, which is the mass times the acceleration due to gravity. Rearranging that for force by multiplying both sides by mg, now the mass in question is the combined masses, which is 30 grams plus 50 grams, giving us 80 grams, which converted to SI units is 0.08 kilograms. Putting our numbers in, gives me 0.525 newtons, which we can now use in our torque equation, giving me 0.0197 newton meters to three significant figures. 
The rotational inertia for the whole toy is the sum of the rotational inertia of each mass. The rotational inertia I of each mass can be estimated by treating each as a point mass for which I equals mr squared, where m is the mass of the object and r is its distance from the pivot. Use the information given to estimate the rotational inertia of the toy about its pivot point, and hence its angular acceleration when it is released from the position shown in part i. So finding our rotational inertia as dictated by the question, that is going to be the sum of our mr squares. We have our m1 r1 squared and our m2 r1 squared. Where we have our 30 gram mass or 0.03 kilograms, a distance of 5 centimetres or 0.05 metres. And we have our 50 gram mass or 0.05 kilograms, and that was a distance of 9 centimetres or 0.09 metres. And that gives me 4.8 times 10 to the minus 4 kg meter square. Now our angular acceleration is related to our inertia and our torque using this equation here. We can solve for angular acceleration by dividing both sides by i. And we know our torque from the question above. That was 0 0.0197. And we just found our inertia over here. Giving me 41.0 radians per second per second to three significant figures. When the toy is released, it oscillates, but eventually ends up stationary in the rest position shown below. Discuss the energy transfers that occur while the toy is oscillating, and explain why it always stops in that exact position. As for the energy transfers, this is essentially a pendulum, where the system's gravitational potential energy is at maximums at our maximum amplitudes, and our kinetic energy is at a maximum at the middle, at the equilibrium position. So the energy transfers in question are the transfers from gravitational potential energy to kinetic energy and then back into gravitational potential energy. Energy is transferred between gravitational potential and kinetic energy. As to why it always stops in that exact position, well that question is kind of twofold. First of all, why does it stop? It stops because the system loses energy to friction. The reason it always stops in that exact position is because that is our position of minimum gravitational potential energy, and for the system to come to a stop, there must be no gravitational potential energy able to be converted into kinetic energy. The only point where this could be true is at our central point here. Furthermore, at this position here, the gravitational force acting from our center of mass is straight down. It is parallel to the radius. That means there is no perpendicular component to the radius, which means it can no longer exert any torque. The system stops due to losses to friction. It stops at this lowest point, as this is the point of minimum potential energy, where no more energy can be transferred to kinetic energy. Furthermore, the gravitational force has no component perpendicular to the radius, and can therefore not exert any torque. Question 2. We're given the mass of the Sun and the mass of the Earth. I'm sure that'll come in handy. The Deep Space Climate Observatory satellite is in a very unusual orbit of the Sun at the L1 point. In this position, the satellite is attracted to both the Sun and the Earth, and it is in a stable orbit around the Sun with the same period as the Earth, keeping it always between the Sun and the Earth. The satellite is 14.81 times 10 to the 10 meters from the sun and 0 0.150 times 10 to the 10 meters from the earth, as we can see in our diagram here. A magazine article states that the L1 point is where the gravitational forces of the sun and the earth are balanced. Explain why this cannot be true if the satellite is moving in a stable circular orbit. And so, as you hopefully recall, an orbit is a form of centripetal motion. Therefore, for the satellite to be moving in an orbit, it must have a centripetal force. As you might recall, the centripetal force is the force that makes an object go around a circle. The centripetal force is not a force itself, instead it is provided by the unbalanced force. Which brings us to the heart of this problem, in order for an orbit to occur, we need an unbalanced force. Specifically, we need an unbalanced force pointing towards the center of the circular motion. A magazine article states that the gravitational forces are balanced, which cannot be the case if the object is moving in centripetal motion.
For the satellite to move in a circle, there must be an unbalanced force towards the centre of its circular motion. Without this centripetal force, the velocity would not change and the satellite would continue in a straight line. The satellite, due to its L1 position between the Earth and the Sun, is under the influence of the gravitational field of the Sun as well as that of the Earth. Show that the net gravitational field strength G at position L1 on the satellite, if it is moving in a circular orbit and is consistent with it having a period of an Earth year, this amount of seconds, is 5.88 times 10 to the minus 3 newtons per kg. And so our gravitational field strength is our gravitational acceleration, and that acceleration in question is going to be our centripetal acceleration. So we can write our gravitational field strength as we would our centripetal acceleration, the equation for which is v squared over r. Now we know the radius of its motion. We were told that up here. That is our 14.81 times 10 to the 10 meters. But we don't know our velocity. Now velocity, as you hopefully recall, is distance over time. Our distance that our satellite is traveling can be written as 2 pi r, where r is the radius of our orbit that we just talked about before. Our time is just the period of its motion, which we're given right here. That gives me 29,507 meters per second, which we can now put into our equation over here. Giving me 5.88 times 10 to the minus 3 meters per second per second. The satellite has special cameras pointing at the sun and at the earth, so it has to spin with a period of one year to keep it in line with these objects as it orbits the sun. The solar panels on the satellite could be moved closer or further from the satellite to adjust the spin period. Explain how moving the solar panels further from the satellite would affect its angular velocity. This is a common question to see in a mechanical systems exam. It is the typical conservation of angular momentum question, where we need to recognize that angular momentum is conserved, and that by moving the solar panels further from the satellite, we are moving the mass further from the center of the satellite, which is increasing the rotational inertia. And by increasing the rotational inertia, we are going to see a reduction in the angular velocity. When the solar panels are moved further from the satellite, this increases the radius of its mass distribution, which increases the rotational inertia. Since angular momentum is conserved as there are no external torques, an increase in rotational inertia must cause a reduction in angular velocity, which increases its spin period. A small fragment of an icy comet hits the spacecraft and sticks to one of the solar panels at a distance of 1.42 meters from the axis of rotation. The fragment has a mass of 0.780 kgs and it increases the angular velocity of the satellite by 0.0124 radians per second. The satellite, with the fragment, is estimated to have a rotational inertia of 179 kg meter square. Determine the impact speed of the fragment relative to the satellite. So the equation I'm going to use is L equals mvr, where our object of mass m strikes the satellite at a radius r from its axis of rotation at a velocity v and causes an increase in angular momentum L. Solving for V, we divide both sides by MR. Now the one thing we don't know is the increase in angular momentum. To find that, we need to use the equation L equals I omega, where L is of course our increase in angular momentum, I is the rotational inertia of the satellite with the fragment, this was stated here, and omega is the increase in our angular velocity, which we're given over here. Now, rather than calculating this separately, this is a pretty simple substitution to do, so I'm just gonna do that. I'm just going to substitute it into our equation over here. Putting our numbers in. And that gives me 2.00 meters per second to three significant figures. Question 3. 
A simple car suspension system rests the weight of a car onto four springs, each attached to a wheel. The car has a mass of 893 kilograms. John sits on the roof in the middle of the car, then slides off, careful to quickly release his weight from the car without pushing down on it. He watches the car oscillate up and down. It completes one oscillation in 1.14 seconds. Show that the spring constant for the combined four spring system is 2.71 times 10 to the 4 newtons per meter. The equation that describes the oscillation of a spring system is this one here. Solving this for k is going to require a bit of a process. First of all, I'm going to divide both sides by 2 pi. Next, I'm going to square both sides to get rid of the square root. And finally, I'm going to swap these two terms around, because mathematically that's a thing I can do. Putting our numbers in. And that indeed gives me 2.71 times 10 to the 4 newtons per metre. John wonders whether the car body is moving with simple harmonic motion. State the conditions for simple harmonic motion. A question that you should always expect in one of these exams. A system undergoing simple harmonic motion accelerates towards equilibrium, and the acceleration is proportional to the displacement from equilibrium. John has a mass of 103 kilograms, and while he sat on the roof, his weight was supported by each of the four wheels equally. Determine the initial amplitude of the oscillation, and hence the maximum acceleration of the car as it oscillates. And so as John sits on the car, the gravitational force that he applies displaces the car from its natural equilibrium. The equation that describes this is f equals negative kx, where f is the force, k is the spring constant that we found earlier, and x is the displacement that we're asked to find initially. And since we're only interested in the magnitude of this, we don't need to worry about the negative there. We don't need to worry about the direction. The force that John applies is gravitational and can be found by mg. Solving this for x just requires us to divide by k. Putting our numbers in. Gives me 0.037285 meters, using a decent amount of significant figures because I want to use this value later. Our next step is to find our maximum acceleration. We can find that using our equation here. Where we know the y, which ironically we've called x, but is also our y, but we don't know our omega, our angular frequency. Now, as with before, we're not concerned about the directionality, so we can just ignore our negative sign here. Now, our angular frequency is found using the equation 2 pi f, where instead of the frequency, we instead know the period, 1.14. So what we can instead do is write this in terms of period, since frequency is 1 over period. Now rather than calculate this separately, we can just substitute it into this equation. And now we just need to put our numbers in. Giving me 1.13 meters per second per second to three significant figures. John and his friend Rick ride in the car together. Speed bumps in the road are 10.5 meters apart. When they are traveling at 8.33 meters per second, the car builds up large vertical oscillations. Explain why this happens and determine Rick's mass. And so, as the car drives forward, it experiences a force from each bump. The oscillations build up as the rate of these applied forces matches the natural frequency of the spring system. This is called resonance. Now, the equation we used earlier to describe an oscillating spring system is this one here. Where the mass is the mass of John, plus the mass of Rick, the latter of which we're trying to find. To solve this for MR, we first divide both sides by 2 pi. Square both sides to get rid of the square root. Multiply both sides by k to get that to the other side. And subtract mj from both sides to solve for mr. Now we know the spring constant, and we know the mass of John, but we don't know the period of the oscillations. 
Now, fortunately, we know the separation of the speed bumps, their distance. We know the velocity that the car is moving at 8.33. And what we're trying to find is the time. Perhaps you can see where this is going. We're going to use our old trusty friend. Velocity is equal to distance over time. Solving that for our time. Substituting in our values. Gives me 1.26 seconds. Putting our numbers in over here. Where this is the mass of John, and I almost forgot the mass of our car, giving me 93.8 kilograms to three significant figures. And we're done.